Good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here. Since several of my students are in the audience tonight, and since I know that at least a few of them would otherwise be in class right now, I thought I'd like to start my talk with a short quiz. Now, I realize that's gutsy based on um, what we heard about tests earlier tonight, but I, I hope you'll all indulge me here. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about your answers. But wait, did I mention that there's a time limit? And a penalty for guessing. Oh, and I know, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting your thoughts, but you should probably also know that all of your future choices with regard to schooling and jobs are all riding on your answer to this question and the questions that come after it, which, by the way, will be worth fewer points if you get this one wrong. <laughs> I think you get the idea. Now, if this were a real test, the next question might ask you to identify what is the author's purpose? What is the next, what is the point that he or she is trying to make? We all love that question. Well, this isn't a real test, so I'll give you the answer. Uh, my purpose here tonight, my message, is not meant to be taken as one of criticism in any way. I recognize that our schools are up against tremendous challenges and they face tremendous inequalities in the populations that they serve. And there is no one-size-fits-all solution to education. Even multiple choice tests have their place. My message, however, tonight is just one of sharing some ideas that I have come across as an educator and hopefully these will spark some interesting ideas of your own, some interesting conversations. A famous uh, philosopher and uh, education reformer, John Dewey, once said that children have four native impulses. Instinctively, children like to communicate and question. Anybody who has ever had to answer the question why seven times in a row to a toddler knows exactly what I mean. Children also like to construct ideas, solutions, models, and they refine these as they learn about their world. The images you see here are of my son Douglas at age two and a half. He's five now. And as you can see, he was hard at work on a solution to fix a broken chair. Soon after he finished, he proudly communicated his solution to me, which I couldn't resist capturing with my camera. <laughs> Would it need refinement? You bet. But that's how we learn. And we've all been doing this since we were very young. But sometimes, I think we lose sight of our innate ability to solve problems. Sometimes I think that we are accustomed to a different mode of education. I, I know that I personally have either been told or read or otherwise ingested volumes of information that I then regurgitated back out onto exams. I can vividly recall in middle school filling in blank maps of every continent in the world. And if my grades were any indication, I was a geography genius. What my grades didn't reveal, though, is I'm actually terrible at geography, and to this day, I struggle to locate Wisconsin on a map of the United States. <laughs> no offense <laughs> to anybody in the audience who might be from Wisconsin, I, I have trouble with everything in between New York and California. In reality, the test was measuring my ability to memorize information for short periods of time, not my actual understanding of the subject matter. But none of this is anything new. And my guess would be that everybody in this room has, at some point, had a similar experience. But as an educator, this presented me with a particular challenge as I started to teach and wanted to avoid some of these same strategies as a teacher that, as a student, were so ineffective with me. So I wanted my students 
to walk away from my classes with something that they wouldn't forget right after they got their grades or passed the course. I wanted them to experience something a little more meaningful, a little more lasting, something that might inspire them to want to learn even more. I wanted to answer that age-old question, what are we ever going to use this for? Fortunately for me, in my first year as a professor, I had a colleague who asked me one day whether or not I was familiar with something called problem-based learning. And I said, problem-based learning? Sure, that's where you solve the problems at the end of the chapter, right? And he said, no, that's not, not exactly right. Well, I come to find out there's a whole body of research which suggests that the best problems are the ones that don't have just one right answer. And the best solutions are usually preceded by several failures, hence the title of my talk. And this made sense to me. I certainly have learned much more from my mistakes than I have from anything that I might have happened to do right the first time. But that's the real world we're talking about. H how can I use this in my classroom? Because classroom and the weir real world have nothing to do with each other, right? Well, not exactly. So problem-based learning is an approach that teaches students both content and problem-solving skills through authentic real-world problems. And the learning is typically done in groups, and the problems are presented before any formal preparation. The problem itself is what drives the learning. And the learning is self-directed. The instructor becomes more of a facilitator, only, re only giving information when it's needed, when it's required. Whoa, now I started to get a little bit nervous. The students are finding the information. There's more than one right answer. I'm more of a coach than a teacher. What if my students don't need me? Well, <laughs> maybe that's exactly what I'm after. I want my students to care enough about a problem, to come up with their own ideas and to research those ideas. I want them to come up with questions that I don't know the answer to because they did that research so thoroughly. Now, can that make a teacher a little bit uncomfortable because we like to think of ourselves as the experts on everything? Absolutely. But the uneasiness fades pretty quickly as you begin to see how engaged the students can become. So, okay, let's say, all right, I'm buying into this. I think it's a good idea. How can I do this with my own students? What makes a good problem for students to work on? Well, there are some guidelines. Typically, a good problem will be open-ended and it will have more than one possible right answer. And you don't give enough information for the students to be able to solve it. They need to find that information out themselves. Helps if the problems are based on something in the real world, something that the students can relate to. And the problem should require them to work with each other, cooperation and teamwork, because that too is a school skill that we will need, do need in the real world. And they tend to build on prior knowledge. Now this screenshot that you see in the lower right corner of the screen is taken from an NSF funded project that I worked on with the colleague that I mentioned previously. And for that project, we traveled to real companies and asked them to give us real problems that they would expect a recent high school or college graduate to be able to work on. So they did that and we took those problems and we created a series of web-based curricula, we call them challenges, that are freely available at the website that, oh good, you can see it there, I can't see it on the screen there, the website that you see there. Teachers are currently using them across the country. There are a total of more than 20 challenges that cover a range of topics in science, technology, engineering, math, and the, um, the one that you see on the screen there is that particular problem was challenging students to design a better wind turbine. And that was done in conjunction with the company Flow Design that 
uh, creates actual wind turbines. What are the benefits of problem-based learning? The research tells us that there are many. A primary benefit is that students no longer panic when confronted with a problem that they're not familiar with, the deer in the headlights look. They know how to tackle it. Now getting there takes time. We like to call that knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. And the challenges provide, they're designed to provide students with tools for doing that. One of the features is what we call the problem solving toolbox, which includes a set of whiteboards. Now, not actual physical whiteboards, virtual ones, although as you can see there, some students prefer still to use the real thing. And the whiteboards ask questions, guiding questions of the students that help them to come to a solution and to test that solution and then to refine their solution if need be. And there are other benefits. Problem-based learning also improves students' understanding and retention. So going back to my map example earlier in, in the talk, if I had needed to find Wisconsin in order to solve a meaningful problem, maybe I would finally remember where it is. PBL promotes, PBL we call it for short, promotes a deep approach to learning. It improves critical thinking, problem-solving skills, motivation to learn, and the student's ability to transfer their knowledge to new situations, so maybe with my newfound geography skills, I could even find Nebraska, too. It's another one I struggle with. So as much as all of that should be enough to convince a person that problem-based learning is a solid approach, I still felt compelled to add one more piece. And that piece for me is that I wanted my students not only to know that they were working on real problems, but I wanted them to know that they were helping real people at the same time. So with that in mind, I started CCSU Cares, a collaboration for assistive resources, equipment, and services, which grew out of my desire to combine problem-based learning and service learning. And so far, We've been doing this now for a few years. The first problem that we took on was twofold in nature. Uh, one piece of the problem is that there are untold amounts of medical equipment, used medical equipment, that goes unused. The photo that you see in the lower left there was taken from a local assisted living facility who just piles up wheelchairs, walkers, all sorts of equipment behind a garage because the garage is already full of equipment that they have no use for. And then the other problem coupled with that is that there are people who need equipment like that and don't have access to it, even in this country. So in order to address those issues, my students have been refurbishing used wheelchairs and donated them to people in need. Those people have come from as far away as Haiti, as you see in the upper photo there, and as close by as our own city of New Britain. The second problem we chose to tackle came to my attention one evening when I was watching the world news. And if you've ever watched the world news, you know that they deliver you 30 minutes of terrible news, and sometimes at the end they like to leave you on a high note and <laughs> give you a story of somebody doing something good. And that night, the story happened to be about a group at the University of Delaware who wanted to address the problem that for very young children, there are no commercially available wheelchairs, motorized wheelchairs. So all of the benefits that go along with mobility, and those are physical benefits, emotional benefits, these children don't experience until this group had the idea that maybe we could take an off-the-shelf ride-on car, make a few modifica modifications to it, and provide that child with mobility. And they were very successful at it. And I saw the piece on the news and said, I have to do this. <laughs> we have to bring this to CCSU. Uh, luckily for me, my students embraced the idea as much as I did. And flash forward uh, about a year and a half, we have since conducted three Go Baby Go workshops. I think you're about to see some video clips from those now, where we've had college students working with high school students and middle school students, all to modify ride-on cars for children with special needs. And as if that wasn't rewarding enough, I have seen other magical things that have happened as a result. Students are more aware of social problems 
and more sensitive to the needs of people who are less privileged or otherwise at risk. Students collaborate with each other. Word got around and now we have social work students working alongside engineering and technology education majors, sharing ideas, each bringing something valuable to the table and learning from each other. And perhaps most importantly, where's my prop? <laughs> I've noticed my students also having fun while they're learning and teaching others. And maybe reliving a little bit of their childhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know I'm out of time, but can I add one final note to that? And that is just that I wanted to revisit the idea of failure. And as much as I advocated as you're learning to solve problems, I have one more slide. <laughs> so as a teacher, I am always trying to improve. And as much as some of my methods work, many of them don't. But just as Thomas Edison, imagine if he had stopped working on the light bulb, I never stop trying to improve my teaching. And if I were to do that, then I think I would be failing my students. And that is not an option. Thank you.